Dr. Emmons, Mrs. Emmons, distinguished platform guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, in case any of you uh, haven't read your programs, I'm Alec Bracken, and I'm presently the president of the Board of Trustees of Ball State University. And I'm certainly very much honored and very proud to have the privilege of serving as your Master of Ceremonies this evening. Certainly the uh, delightful musical entertainment provided by the Brass Ensemble conducted by Mr. Hood and the Men's Glee Club directed by Jack Trussell is a most appropriate way to begin this program, which after all is for the purpose of paying tribute to the president of Ball State University and his wife, Dr. and Mrs. John R. Emmons. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's a privilege for all of us to be here to do this, and I think that uh, we're going to have a good evening. I think we're going to have a, a, uh, a pleasant evening, and the fact that you're all here, uh, I believe, is going to assure that it will be a success. One of President Emmons' uh, favorite comments, which I, we've all heard him make many times, is um, that a certain day is a red-letter day. Well, there have been a number of these significant red-letter days in Dr. Emmons' 23 years at Ball State, and I'm sure that this will be another one of these. And many of these days, of course, are red-letter days because of the tremendous leadership which Dr. Edmonds has given to this institution. And so we're, we're all here tonight to try to make this a red-letter day for the Edmonds. Well, we who live in this community, whether as part of the university family or whether in the business and professional community, I think we each one of us feel daily the impress of this university on the cultural and the business and the social life of this entire community and its surrounding area. And I think along with that also goes the, the, the feeling that we each have of the recognition of the tremendous contributions which President Emmons has, has made in furnishing the vision and the imagination and the faith in the future and the knowledge and the steadfast determination to bring Ball State to the worthy place it now holds amongst the leading universities of North America. And so we've asked representatives from the students, from the faculty, from the community, from the alumni, and from President Emmons professional colleagues in Indiana to participate in this program honoring him tonight. And first, I <clears throat> would like to present to you William Greer, who is a junior from Lafayette and who, as president of the Ball State Student Senate, will speak on behalf of the students. Bill? <clears throat> Good evening. I I just noticed that, uh, I think, put up here expressly for me, there's a large clock. I'm always happy that someone can walk up and pull his notes out of his coat. That means they're not so big that uh, he'll mess up his coat. And I assure you this will be a short set of remarks, but very important in its statement of where we are right now at the point that President Emmons has led us. When an important mainstay of any organization leaves its chambers. Many debate the importance of his passing role. From the halls and chambers of Ball State walks the man who has held the reins and ridden the bronco of an emerging university. Drifting in and out in uh, four and five year terms during his administration have been thousands of young people. The subject product, and future of the world. Dr. Emmons has kept the student as the focal point of Ball State's existence. 
in a time when multiversities are prostituting their force to the maxims of research and publisher parish, Ball State has kept its head above the pollution of synthetic motivations for existence. Ball State remains and progresses as one of the nation's few state-supported institutions dedicated to the edification of the world's youth. Left as a heritage, Dr. Emmons has willed to the future administration a process of student involvement that is envied in the eyes of students from other universities across the length and width of this nation. Ball State has more active student members of policy councils and committees than any other university. Ball State has emerged, has an emerging student policy-making legislature that will soon be able to assume the responsibilities for student-oriented policies. Dr. Emmons, the athlete, has left a legacy of athletics which has begun to grow in, natural, in national stature. I remind you, Ball State has the football team that has played in more postseason bowl games than any other school in the state of Indiana. Dr. Emmons, during his term in office, as he loves to mention to the students, the, has been constantly involved with the building of a stadium. One of his favorite stories is of the plan for the university in 1945, when the stadium was one of the first concerns. We now have a stadium, although I wonder of the nature of the concern. We have a stadium that's grown from board seats around a field to a concrete and steel structure that will grow with Ball State itself. And finally, we have developed a program of athletics that has allowed us to seek acceptance in a renowned national conference. In view of Dr. Emmons' constant student orientation, I have been asked by the president of Blue Key Honor Fraternity to announce and explain the student's monument to President Emmons. I'll read you the letter. Dear student body president, the men of Blue Key National Honor Fraternity would like to announce award in the honor of President John R. Emmons. This award shall be called the John R. Emmons Award. Novel name. It will be given to the most outstanding senior, whether male or female. This shall stand as the highest honor attainable for any undergraduate Ball State student. This award is a lasting monument to the outstanding services and contributions that Dr. Emmons has made to Ball State University during his 23 years serving as president of this institution. To be considered for this award, a student must be nominated by another student, a faculty member, or an administrator. The student will be selected by a committee comprised of the president of the university, vice president of student for student affairs, vice president for public affairs, director of alumni relations, and the director of student programs. Fraternally yours, the men of Blue Key. I might emphasize this award. Most institutions recognize academic prowess, whether through a dean's list or outstanding students. Across the country and in the emerging universities, many other motivations are coming to the forefront for going to college. And there are many other ways to excel in a university. This award 
will be exemplary, or Dr. Emmons' respect for the whole student, the student that is responsible in the classroom, an adult outside of it. I'm very hopeful that this award will become the tradition as the outstanding award in a state university. And I hope that this example will lead other schools to recognize these qualities in students. During the next year, Ball State will tease with the chaotic questions of discrimination, student power, activism, drugs, and demonstrations. During this period, we will, I'm sure, fall upon the posture and institutional profile of the then absent good doctor. I might end these remarks with a personal comment. Dr. Emmons, I marvel that such a young man might have gray hair. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Prayer for that very appropriate tribute to a very great president. When President Emmons came to Ball State in 1945, there were approximately 200 on the then staff at Ball State, 75 of whom were members of the teaching faculty. Dr. Lester Hewitt, chairman of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and a member of the Ball State faculty since 1946, speaks tonight for the more than 2,000 members of the Ball State family, composed of staff, administrative personnel, and over 700 full-time faculty members. It is with pleasure that I present to you Dr. Hewitt. Hewitt. President Emmons, it's my distinct pleasure to express on behalf of the Ball State University faculty, administrative personnel, and staff, our appreciation for your many years of leadership in this university. Some of us, it is true, are only newly arrived. Others of us have, like yourself, made Ball State our home for a long time. And regardless of length of service, the university is and has been and will be our professional home. Its intellectual, personal, and physical climate provides a setting for the endeavors of our faculty and staff as it has for yours. Thus, it's with deep appreciation that we recall this evening your many contributions in creating and maintaining a university environment in which we, too, have been privileged to serve with pride and satisfaction. Available time does not, may, does not allow the listing of an extensive bill of particulars, and I can therefore refer to only a few of the presidential policies and practices that comprise a significant part of the record we acknowledge this evening. First, as befits a university, you have by your own scholarly performance in the field of higher education, set a wholesome example for us to follow. Through your own publications and professional service to state and national organizations, you have persistently demonstrated a concern for expanding the horizons of verifiable knowledge, as well as for promoting the organizational structure through which this knowledge may be put to effective use. Your encouragement to us to become increasingly involved in research, as well as in the support of the multitude of professional organizations we represent, has not only been personally gratifying and appreciated, but it has also contributed to the place of this university today in the academic resources of the state and the nation. Secondly, while the name Teachers College no longer identifies the entire university, 
You have continuously sought to remind us of the importance of good teaching in our own classrooms. Clearly a fundamental in the preparation of good teachers for the classrooms of the state and the nation. And in your innumerable addresses to the faculty, to the student body, to citizens and professional groups, as well as to members of the Indiana legislature on periodic occasions, you have shown an effective ability to share information and to enhance understanding itself a basic element in good teaching. Thirdly, throughout an era when external pressures have often sought to compromise the intellectual integrity of the scholar and teacher, you have staunchly supported the, <clears throat> the principle of freedom of inquiry in the responsible search for truth. While we may characteristically have complained on occasion about parking and other inconveniences, we have not throughout these years had to wonder whether the exploration of unpopular ideas or issues would jeopardize our jobs. Linked with this is your support in the formation and the operation of a viable university senate during the past six years, through which we as faculty and administrative personnel have increasingly shared in the responsible formulation of the policies that govern the university. In your role as chief administrator, You've never sidestepped issues which required decisions, however unpleasant some of them may have been. But you've also ensured that others of us who have equity in such decisions have had some part in their determination. Last but not least, we acknowledge our appreciation for your persistent efforts to maintain a working climate in which our own day-to-day -day activities can be performed with security and with dignity. Perhaps the phrase open door seems a cliché, but its application to the door of your own office has been nonetheless real. Your assistance in establishing a sound program of insurance and related measures for the security of our families is another mark of that concern, as has been your interest in the maintenance of a well-landscaped and eye-pleasing campus, which all may enjoy, along with the, rich, the enriched cultural opportunities, made possible by this Emmons Auditorium. But most of all, this has been expressed in your guaranteeing that the phrase, Ball State is a friendly campus, is more than an empty one. In the time you've taken to know each of us, including each year's alphas as well as omegas, in your personal concern for the well-being of our families, in your gracious example of hospitality, you've helped to make this university community one marked by a spirit of helplessness helpfulness, and goodwill between associates. And this, of course, you've not labored alone. This encouragement of friendliness and goodwill has been shared by your gracious wife, Eileen, who's helped our wives to feel at home in the campus community, and who, with you, has so generously hosted us in your home year after year. Mrs. Emmons, we're deeply indebted to you, no less than to President Emmons, for having made this a warm campus, a friendly campus, a good community in which to work and live. For this, we honor you both and wish you well in the years ahead. Thank you very much, Dr. Hewitt, for this very gracious um, statement from the, on behalf of the faculty and staff of this university. Listening to this public tribute to President Emmons tonight, our Ball State alumni in five key cities who are hearing the program by means of a special leased wire arrangement with the telephone company. Here to represent these alumni in person, and to speak in, in, in behalf of some 30,000 Ball State alumni is Harold Tom Wallace, a member of the class of 1952. Mr. Wallace, who is presently Director of Public Relations for Eli Lilly Company in Indianapolis, is President of the Ball State Alumni Association. It gives me pleasure to present to you at this time, Tom Wallace. Tom. Thank you, Mr. Bracken, President and Mrs. Emmons, friends of Ball State University. 
It's a great honor for me this evening to represent the thousands of Ball State alumni who I'm, I, who I'm, I, I'm sure feel deeply about this occasion. As was mentioned, many of these are a part of this program through special hookups at dinners throughout the state. Certainly this occasion has special meaning for the alumni when one considers that over 80% of all the bachelor degrees ever granted by Ball State University have been signed by Dr. Emmons. And over 97% of all the graduate degrees ever granted have been signed by Dr. Emmons and that thousands of students have attended the university under his direction. It is impossible to truly express what Dr. Emmons has meant to all of us. The lives of the Lee Morrises and the Timmy Browns, the Dean Spikers and the Donita Stobas, and the promise of the Ed Shipleys and the Joe Peach and the Vicki Fullers better express the two, true contribution of Ball State and Dr. Emmons than I can in my comments. These are the people in his often expressed concern for people, programs, services, and things. One of Dr. Emmons' greatest contributions is to build a university in which alumni can take pride. As a Burroughs High School student and a part of the Ball State family, when Dr. Emmons came to Muncie 23 years ago, I especially admire the way he went about his task. A new administrator in business, government, or education has either the opportunity of wiping the slate clean or integrating the best of the past with the strength of the present and building for a promising future. It is this latter road that was taken by Dr. Emmons when he arrived at Ball State and that has led the university into greatness during his 23 years. Certainly the institution of 1,009 students in 1945 is as different from the University of 14,000 today as the spirit of St. Louis is from a Boeing 737. However, the Earl Johnsons and Mark Studebakers and Angie Wilsons, the Charlie B. DeMotts and the Max Carmichaels who helped produce quality students before 1945 contributed full lives to both of these worlds. Add to their heritage the youthful vigor of the John Hannafords and the Bill Middletons, and alumni have every reason to be proud of their university and in the way it evolved. Almost 100 years ago, the man who became the 20th president of the United States, James A. Garfield, paid a tribute to a great teacher, Mark Hopkins, then president of Williams College. I am not willing that this discussion should close without mention of the value of a true teacher, said Garfield. Give me a log hut with only a simple bench, Mark Hopkins on one end and I on the other, and you may have all the buildings, apparatus, libraries without him. For Garfield, one great teacher created the community of learning. The buildings, the apparatus, the libraries were only the tools of teaching. If each of us were to list the names of individuals who most profoundly influenced the life of Ball State University, I'm sure that one name would stand out, that of Dr. John R. Emmons, teacher, administrator, inspiring leader, and concerned friend. For thousands of alumni, John Emmons, like Mark Hopkins, has been the man on the other end of the bench. An American historian wrote in The Education of Henry Adams, a teacher affects eternity. He can never tell where his influence stops. So long as Ball State University shall stand, it will bear the imprint of John Emmons. He cannot leave the university. He is too much a part of its tradition, of its very soul. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Tom, for this fine expression from all of the alumni of Ball State to President Emmons. Probably no one individual in this community has watched the fortunes of Ball State under President Emmons' leadership more carefully and with greater pride than Dr. Lal D. Montgomery, who has served as Chief of Pathology at Ball Memorial Hospital for over 30 years. Neighbor, friend, patron, wise counselor and valued community leader, Dr. Montgomery speaks tonight in behalf of the Muncie community. This is the service clubs for men and women, the business and professional leaders, and the host of people who have come to know and admire Dr. Emmons for his tremendous contributions to this community. I have the honor to present to you Dr. Lyle Montgomery. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, President Emmons, Ms. Emmons members of the Muncie community and the communities far and wide that are here tonight. It's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to have an opportunity to tell you some of the things, and uh, not nearly enough in the time that we have, that Jack Emmons and Aline and the family have meant to Muncie as a community. When he came to Muncie and Ball State Teachers College in 1945, the new president, John R. Emmons, soon to be better known as Jack Emmons, came to the place and to take the place and carry on the work of a real, for sure, Hoosier and Delaware County native son, Lemuel Pittenger. This was a hard thing to do, but the years have shown that he did it and did it in a superlative way. Everyone can see that his presidency and its effect on Ball State and on Muncie have been far-reaching. And its effect on Ball State uh, have been far-reaching. But also, as a citizen, he has had a highly personal part in making Muncie a better place to live. In this, Aline Emmons has joined him. And his open-door policy has been true not only of his office, but has included the gracious hospitality of the Emmons home. In this and many other ways, Jack Emmons has spread his personal and professional strength and guidance. And no part of Muncie or the surrounding communities has failed to get to know him as a friend because, as one admirer said, he is always available and he always participates. He has been active in the church, civic clubs, community enterprises of many kinds, including leading a United Fund campaign to a successful oversubscription. He has been a member of the Ball Memorial Hospital Board and has encouraged the interrelationship of the university health services and the hospital, as well as the coordination of the nursing and medical technology program. His interest in the business community includes the Chamber of Commerce, as well as membership on many boards and committees, local and state government problems in general, and as related to the university, have been of special concern to him. And as the campus has grown, the interest taken by the community in orderly and far-seeing planning has been constantly welcomed and encouraged. The Muncie Symphony Orchestra has had his unfailing and vigorous support. He has been a member of its board for many years and has given unstintingly of his time and encouragement to help promote this outstanding community university project. These are just a few of the ways Jack Emmons has entered the community and been a part of it. Wherever he was wanted and needed, he has been immediately available, and he has had the policy of making it possible for the faculty and students alike to be available too whenever the community calls. And wherever he has taken part, it has been in a characteristically warm-hearted, personal, and positive way. In these and many other ways, Jack Emmons and Ball State have become part 
of the Muncie community, rather than being isolated in the academic community as a separate entity. Visitors are constantly amazed at the lack of the town versus gown type of division of interests and resulting conflict that too often have been traditional in college towns. Nowhere is our common interest and oneness of purpose more magnificently expressed than in this auditorium in which we sit tonight, which marks for all to see the way our community responded and to blend its efforts and interests with Ball State in the creation of this beautiful building. Anyone looking at the great audiences that continue to enjoy the pos widest possible benefit from the facilities of this auditorium cannot fail to be thrilled by this evidence that in this way there is coming to Muncie and Ball State to students, faculty, townsmen, and neighbors alike that kind of association and enjoyment and cultural opportunities that Jack Emmons has wanted to see develop ever since he came to be one of us. It is indeed fitting that this auditorium is named after John R. Emmons. We cannot tell exactly how much Jack Emmons has done to make Muncie a better community in which to live and bring up our families and do all the things that we have done together for the past 23 years, nor can we tell all the ways in which he has done it, but he has. In these years, he has touched every part of our community and every member of our community has benefited in one way or another from his touch. Many years ago, I was walking on the campus with Jack Emmons, and around us, the campus life streamed on its complex way. We passed one group after another of students, all chatting and laughing and hurrying and acting the way college students do. <coughs> Jack stopped and looked around him and made a remark that I think might well be the touchstone of his life with us all, when he said, Monty, aren't they wonderful? I am sure this is the way he feels toward all of us. Jack thinks we are wonderful, and we think he is wonderful. Thank you very much, Lyle, for expressing so eloquently the feelings of this community for Jack and Aline Emmons. A Hoosier presidential colleague who is also retiring from academic leadership this year has been invited to speak for all Indiana College and University presidents on this occasion. He is Dr. Otto P. Kretzmann, president of Valparaiso University, who upon his retirement brings to an end a distinguished 28-year career at our Northern Indiana Institution of Higher Learning. Dr. Kretzmann and Dr. Emmons have been lifelong friends, and they, they, they have really quite a bit in common. They both came to Indiana in the 1940s to head at that time relatively small schools. For in 1940, Valparaiso University had approximately 300 students, whereas Ball State had 1,009 when Dr. Emmons came here in 1945. And now this year, each man leaves a large university, highly recognized in its field, and with students coming from all states of the Union and some 26 foreign countries. Also, each has made a significant contribution in building the academic and, per and uh, professional programs of their respective institutions. Dr. Kretzmann had the honor last week of seeing the sixth college formerly established at Valparaiso University, the College of Nursing. And he's been instrumental in building programs which have resulted in the growth of that university from 350,000 to over 30 million in plant valuation alone. And I'm sure many of you who have driven along US 30 in northern Indiana have been struck by the beauty of the chapel on the campus at Valparaiso which can very easily be seen from US 30. And I might add, it can also be seen from the Pennsylvania Railroad, which I still ride between Fort Wayne and Chicago. 
<coughs> in fact, the view's better from the Pennsylvania than from the highway. Well, this is just one of the many buildings for which he has been responsible. Well, much more could be said about Dr. Kretzmann's professional career. He's a well-recognized educator and a church leader, and he has the honor of heading the largest Lutheran-affiliated university in America. He's a scholar and the author of numerous books, and he has received honorary degrees from many universities and colleges in this country. And so it is a distinct privilege to introduce to you tonight President Emmons' longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Kretzmann, president of Valparaiso University. Dr. Kretzmann. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, distinguished colleagues, and my good friend Jack. Until a few moments ago, I was the only one on the platform who didn't know whom he represented. Uh, I represent all the colleges and universities in the state of Indiana, and I want some of my colleagues to note that. Uh, <laughs> Well, as this date came nearer and nearer to my calendar, I asked my secretary to find out from the office of the Indiana Conference on Higher Education or the office of the, what is it, Independent Church-Related Colleges and find out whether I was representing them. <laughs> she came back at the end of 20 minutes and she said, no, they say no, you're not. Uh, in fact, one of them said, good heavens, though. <laughs> 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 I think it should be said that I would like to say a word on behalf of the um, private church-related colleges because Jack has been one of the uh, men, together with Indiana and Purdue and Indiana State, who have uh, created here in Indiana a better relationship between the private colleges and the public colleges better than I think anybody else in America has done. And this has been doing due to a very favorable attitude on the two ways in which we have been trying to develop American higher education in our time. I was interested in the approach of the committee to this affair. They gave three rules for this occasion. The first one was make it short, and the second one was make it brief. And the third one's make it short. <laughs> I was very much interested a moment ago when I learned that the alumni are sitting around the country, probably with some better refreshments than we have here. <laughs> and I think the nicest thing I can do for Jack tonight is to compare his retirement to my own. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll feel much better. Um, I announced it to the faculty some months ago. There was some scattered applause, but not too much. Um, and somehow or other it got out of everything that goes on at faculty meetings gets out, you know. So the next morning the local newspaper had a headline. Not a very big one, it was only about only about half as big as when I came 28 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so the next afternoon I thought, I'm going to take an hour off and go downtown to see what effect this tremendous news has had in the community. <laughs> and then I went to the drugstore and nothing happened there. <laughs> I even went in the tavern and had a beer. <laughs> Less happened there. <laughs> So finally I landed in our butcher shop, the butcher who has been supplying a um, hamburger to our family for a little over two decades. <laughs> and he was grinding away <laughs> the hamburger and uh, he said, I, I see by the paper you quit. <laughs> and uh, I, <laughs> I said, yeah. And uh, he says, well, you know, as I always say, here today, gone tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> 
28 years down the drain. <laughs> For the alumni who are sitting in there, started with them a moment ago, I must tell Jack the two stories, uh, the one story about two retiring presidents. What are you going to do after your, your retirement? And he said, I'd, <coughs> I'd like to become the uh, superintendent of an orphanage because you get no letters from the parents. Jack, we have before us a highly intelligent academic audience, huh? <laughs> well, the other one said, I would like to become warden of a state prison because the alumni don't come back. <laughs> I have to watch my... No oh, I, I was one. Does Ball State teach statistics, Jack? Statistics? I'd I like to see the statistics professor before I leave town. <laughs> I heard a story out west last, <coughs> about last month that a professor of statistics got to be quite famous, so he's making a lot of lecture trips around the country. The moonlighting, we call it. <laughs> and and he, cause he, he, had, he has such a heavy schedule that, um, and has to do a good deal of flying. So he was sitting at home one day and heading for another flight, and he wanted to know what his chances would be of getting on a plane with, an, with a bomb in it. So he thought this would be worth investigating, so he stuffed all sorts of information <coughs> into the computer, how far he was going, how fast he was going, everything he put in. And then the, the computer came out with quite a high ratio. He had a pretty good chance of getting on a plane with a bomb in it. So he thought that over for a while, and then he said, <laughs> thought to himself, what are my chances for getting on a plane with two bombs on it? So once more, he fed all the information <laughs> into the computer, <coughs> and out, of course, came, as you all know, a, a much lower ratio. And he studied that very carefully, and now whenever he goes away from home, he carries his own bomb. I hope that some of you will be kind enough to explain that to me. I still don't understand it. <laughs> I just suspect there's something wrong with it somewhere. <laughs> so, Jack, I have now been planning my future. I have two folders at home. One, I have unfinished problems, and the other is finished problems. And every day as things come up, I stick them in one folder or the other for my successor. Uh, on the front of the folder, on the... <laughs> On the unfinished problems, I have, um, good luck to you, boy. You can reach me in Florida or Hawaii. <laughs> and the finished problem folder, folder has, keep your sticky hands off this. <laughs> that's about the best, I suppose, the best advice anybody could have. Uh, I have another problem here. The last time I did this sort of thing, talking to somebody who's about to retire, was at St. Joe, uh, Jack, last year. Father Gross retired. And uh, I don't know whether you know that Father Gross of St. Joseph's College and I are the two best, well, we are the best soliciting team in the state. When we come in, we usually get something. <laughs> and um, how we do it is that Father Gross starts out with a <coughs> few well-chosen words about purgatory. And then if I find that he's not making a dent on the guy behind the desk, then I bring in some good old-fashioned Protestant hellfire. <laughs> and between us, we make a real dent. <laughs> but <coughs> at this particular farewell for Father Gross, we were telling the stories about the, some of the experiences we had. And the one that stands out most is you know, we went to some field company in, uh, in Gary, I guess it was, and uh, we sent our cards in, as we always do. And the manager called us in, and he had his cards, one in each hand. And he said, uh, let me get this straight now. He said, turned to me and said, you're a Lutheran? And I said, yes, sir. And Father Gross, you're a Catholic? Yes, sir. And the two of you are going out with each other and collecting money for each other's schools? And he said, yes, sir. 
He said, what the hell happened to the Reformation? <laughs> Father Groth, the younger and much faster on the trigger than I am, he said, uh, we're ignoring it this week, we need the money. <laughs> I think what I'd like to do, Jack, just for a moment, is to say a personal affectionate word to you, and the rest of us can listen if you want to listen in. <laughs> you are probably looking back tonight, and you're probably also, I'm sure you are, looking forward. If you would tonight compare the 20th century to a 24-hour day, uh, you and I came to Indiana shortly before noon, say about 11 o'clock in the morning. We have lived through the entire <coughs> afternoon of the 20th century, and tonight in the year of our Lord, 1968, we're probably at about 5 o'clock in the afternoon. The children whom we have in the classes, if you talk to them in convocation, you suddenly realize that for the first time in the last few years, you are talking to the 21st century. These youngsters, these students of ours on our campus will just be in the prime of life when the third millennium of Christian history dawns. This makes the entire educational enterprise in our time and in our age a tremendous project of bread on far waters. You're betting on these kids, you're doing everything you possibly can for them, but you know very well that what will happen about what you say to them and do for them and with them, you will never see. And I have for a while carried in a little pole of mine. I the theme for two articles, which I still want to write some of these days. One would be what our children will curse us about in the, on New Year's Eve of the year 2000. And the other will be what our children will bless us about on New Year's Eve of the year 2000. What are they going to curse us about? Well, I suppose to some extent, things that you see evidence in the race question. Yeah. Yeah strange misunderstandings of the population explosion, the even greater misunderstandings of the knowledge explosion, and so on. They'll have something to talk about, and as you know, not all of it will be very good. They will bless us for people like Jack, who in this morning and afternoon of the 20th century stayed with it, shall I say, threw his bread on far waters, never mind however it can ever come back to him, and this, Jack, was a tremendous thing to do, and one thing that I learned from you very early and very decisively. You look back now, and when Jack came here, that was the year in which we, as a human race, learned that we had the power to commit suicide, and that we're much closer to it tonight than we were then. And it was only 12 years later, space age came, 1957, and we suddenly learned that we could lead the planet. As one of my deans said, <laughs> we can for the first time in history get the hell out of here. <laughs> That's not a very good theological way of putting it, but I think you get the general idea. <laughs> <laughs> Those two events placed, as Jack looks back now upon his career here, placed in such juxtaposition and probably would mean more for the educational process than anything we can possibly think of. I am not one of those who shares some of the superficial optimism of the postmodern world. I can't forget the fact that, well, we've been sitting here now for two hours since we started the eat. <laughs> uh, the world's population is increasing by 7,000 hours. Uh, so, let's say well, since we've been together with the from the beginning of the dinner, we have about 14,000 more people, human beings, in the world. 
of these 7,000 hour, as you probably will recall, 5,000 are non-white, non non-Western, non-Christian. Lay that aside for a moment. <coughs> it means that my two sons are home, three sons, will, will live in a world in which they will suddenly become conscious, or have already become conscious, that they are a minority. Much greater minority, a smaller minority than we ever thought possible. And then, of course, as you know, when a minority swings into action, one or two things can happen. Either it begins to accept its status and move into oblivion gradually, or it might be that we could recover once more the greatest days of our own country when we were really in a minority. Or shall I go a step farther back, the first three centuries of the Christian church when they knew they were a minority and still beat the Roman Empire down within three centuries. This is going to be their task. Now you and I here in Muncie or Valparaiso, where it may be, we are not yet conscious day after day and hour after hour that that's what's happening to us. And that the revolution of rising expectations in Asia and in Africa will one of these days strike our children. And again, I go back to this, whatever we can do for them now, I think should be done with all the gifts and support, strength that we possibly have. This will be a funny story, not a, oh, not funny, strange story to end what I have to say to Jack tonight, but I think he'll understand it, and I'm applying it to him because uh, I think it fits very well. It's always uh, seemed strange to me that uh, people climb mountains. And one of the strangest stories about a man like this is about Mallory, the English explorer, who may vaguely recall tried several times to get up <coughs> Mount Everest. He never made it. But the last time he tried, he had quite a company with him, and they parked and uh, stopped halfway up the mountain, or two, two thirds of the way up the mountain. And then it was agreed that Mallory and a few companions, two other men, were to make the last fast, rugged dash for the top. And so everybody gathered around where they had camped and watched Mallory and <coughs> his two friends uh, disappear into the dark and the snow and the ice. And then he went back to the camp and waited, waited one day, two days, three days. And at the end of the third day, they sent a runner down into the plains of India with instructions to wire cable to Mallory's mother and sister. So he did that, and this the wording of this cable I have never forgotten. Largely well, because it can apply to somebody like Jack or anyone else who's made an outstanding contribution to our life and our time. The cable read, uh, Mallory and his party have not returned. Their loss seems certain. When last seen, this is what I like, when last seen, they were going strong for the top. And you can say that of a man at the end of so many years as Jack could put in here. And I'll say it again. When last seen, I'm sure we can say of him, he was going strong for the top. I have to go home now because <laughs> uh, we've got demonstrations. <laughs> I'm sure, Dr. Kretzman, if there were any of your colleagues from the Indiana colleges and universities who doubted the wisdom of the choice of the committee in selecting you to speak for them, those, those fears are gone now, and they realize how wise the committee was in its choice. Um, really, this is, is, is Jack's story, but as long as I'm on my feet, I think I'll tell it. And it, it relates to Dr. Kretzman and is true. Uh, a number of years ago, 
And I, and, and I think that perhaps by the remarks that Dr. Kretzmann has made, you, you'll immediately realize that this is a true story. Um, a number of years ago, um, there was to be a meeting of the presidents of the uh, schools, colleges, and universities in Indiana, in Indianapolis. And Dr. Kretzmann was uh, designated to call the presidents of the various schools in his area of northern Indiana. And one of those schools, the president rather, that he was to call was Sister Madaliva, who was then president of um, the girls' school across from uh, Notre Dame, St. Mary. Many of you here uh, knew Sister Madaliva, who was a very wonderful, wonderful person. So um, Dr. Kretzmann called her, and as you can see, he's inclined to be a bit humorous at times. When Sister Madaliva answered the phone, he said, Sister Madaliva, this is Martin Luther. <laughs> to which Sister Madaliva promptly replied, Martin, how in hell are you? I would take it on that day they hadn't forgotten the Reformation. <laughs> Maybe they weren't raising money together that day, Jack. <clears throat> well, Jack, I'm sure that uh, your friends in the audience, as well as those in alumni centers in Indiana and Ohio, who have been pointed out are hearing this program through the wire services, could add many, many more words of praise for your services here. And we have hundreds of congratulatory messages which have come in during the day, which we will pass along to you later to read. But while we're still on the subject of, of saying tribute to Jack, if you uh, if you'll bear with me for just a minute, Jack, and forgive me for being just a bit personal, I I, I couldn't let this opportunity pass without uh, without saying publicly with with what high admiration and affection I have held uh, for Jack Emmons, and I've been really extremely proud to have been granted the privilege, and I think it has been a privilege, of serving as a member of the governing board of Ball State. Actually, February the 19th of this year, it'll be for 14 years, which is over half the time of your presidency, Jack, and for 12 of those years as um, chairman of the board. Well, it's been a it, it, it's been a great association for me, I know that. And it's been a tremendously rewarding one. For during this time, I think it's afforded to me the opportunity not only to work closely with you, Jack, but to share to at least some extent some of your problems, not all of them, some of your objectives, help on solving some of them, and also your devotion, not only to this university, but to this community. And I know that I speak not only for myself, but for all of the trustees who have served on either the Old Teachers College Board or on the Ball State University Board of Trustees during these last 14 years. When I say that we all have found in you a president who has been wise, who's been imaginative, you've been considerate. And in all of this, you've, had a, a, you've been very conscious of a very rich heritage of the past. And yet above all, you've been aware of the challenge and the tremendous challenges of the expanding future, not only of this university, but of this community and you've been willing to face up to them and try to find the answers. Well, it's been a great experience for all of us, and I think that over this 14 years, 
The trustees of this school have worked together. They've worked together well. they worked well with the administration and with the president. And I think we've all tried to work for the good of Ball State University. Well, Jack, I'm sure by this time uh, you realize that you have a good many friends in the community and that uh, we all have a very deep affection and admiration. Affection for you and, admin and appreciation and admiration of you. And um, I wonder if we might persuade you to say a few words at this time. <laughs> Jack? <clears throat> oh my. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> to the president of my board, <clears throat> to the platform guests, and to friends in the audience. The program already printed says that I'm to make a response. And my notes say that I'm to make acknowledgments and thank yous. And so to the platform guests and the speakers, to all the members of the audience present here in the College Community Auditorium, to the alumni groups who are listening by telephonic connection, Mrs. Emmons and I, Aline and I, wish to express our appreciation for the planning for and for your participation in the recognition program. Uh, we fully realize, as you do, that the growth and development of Ball State University has been a joint, cooperative effort, initiated by the original gift of the Ball Brothers, supplemented through the years by thousands upon thousands of others, including citizens, donors, foundations, state officials, members of the successive legislatures, faculty, and staff, with special recognition to the emeriti who prepared the foundation upon which we are now building a superstructure. To the alumni, someone has already indicated approximately 30,000 of them, and to the students who are now on the campus and have already been participants. And of course, also to the host of colleagues and associates across the nation. And I want to add special appreciation to the representatives of the Indiana Conference on Higher Education, from one of whom you have heard tonight. And then another item of the cooperative effort of the presence of the four state institutions of higher education, because the likes of the organizations, these two that I have mentioned, the Indiana Conference on Higher Education and the four state institutional cooperation, these are not found in other states across the nation. Well, institutional progress is, uh, is more tangible and a lasting reward than personal credit. And if I may jump to another kind of springboard, I'd like to say something like this. In man's age-old search for truth, excellence, and happiness, we find that anthropology and sociology, history, philosophy, psychology, and religion all join in agreement that man is most happy when alone or joined with others he makes the good and the beautiful come true. Or to be more explicit, probably the greatest satisfaction that can come to an individual, to a man or to a woman, is to be associated with, to be an integral part of an ongoing creative developing program or cause or institution that had beginnings reaching back that has a present and that has an expanding future extending beyond one's own years of service. And all of these elements, all of these elements are inherent in Ball State University. I'd like to read that again. Man is, or woman is most happy and has greater satisfaction when associated with or an integral part of an ongoing creative developing program or cause or institution that had beginnings reaching back, that has a present, and that has an expanding future, extending beyond one's years of service. And again, all of the elements are here. Now, having made these statements, one uh, could reminisce, could report incidents and details concerning the past or even the present. 
But as I reported to the Ball State alumni at their last fall's meeting, the 50th anniversary is really a, an opportunity for a backward and a forward look. And I'm not much in favor of looking backward, except perhaps to take a good look at the foundation which has been provided for the present structure and to indicate some springboards for the next 50 years. And so in concluding, I'd like to anticipate the next 50 years by saying something like this. Ball State University offers an invitation, an invitation to faculty and staff to strive for excellence. To present and future students, it offers a challenge for growth and development. To board members, an opportunity for, and a privilege to serve. To members of our legislature and to our state officials and to interested donors and citizens, an opportunity to participate in the strengthening of this ongoing, expanding institution of higher education. As these invitations and challenges and privileges and opportunities are accepted, and to the extent to which they are met, will Ball State University fulfill its destiny as an outstanding institution of higher education. Now, finally, there are so many statements and so many questions about these past 23 years. Let me simply say for both of us, for Aline and for me, there have been some frustrating minutes and some frustrating hours and perhaps a few frustrating days. But the weeks and the months and the years, they have been satisfying and rewarding, as everybody already knows. And so we thank each and one of every one of you, and we are confident that you will extend these same efforts and this same support to our successors. Thank you for coming, and thank you for listening. <laughs>